You are watching Maximus Aviation. Here we go. One, two, three, four. So it was treetops. I looked out my window. I was in the middle of the airplane on the right wing. I tried to get close to the back of the airplane as possible. It's an experience nobody wants to ever experience. Never. <laughs> We interrupt this program for a special news bulletin. Three young singers who soared to the heights of show business on the current rock and roll craze were killed today in the crash of a light plane in an Iowa snow flurry. Three members of the country rock group Leonard Skinner were among six people killed when a twin-engine plane crashed in a southeastern Mississippi swamp. The dead were lead singer Ronnie Van Zant, guitarist Steve Gaines, and Gaines' sister, vocalist Cassie Gaines. <laughs> Greetings, everybody. Maximus here. Well, as you can see by the title and thumbnail, we're going to talk about the top 10 aviation crashes involving some of the most famous and talented musicians in history. I know most of you are well aware of the musical history and fame of all of the people on our list today. So we're going to focus on the aviation side and causes of these tragic events more than the music itself. I mean, this is an aviation channel after all, right? But sure, I'll throw in some history and backstories. But sadly, this video is all about the tragic ending of their careers, not their beginnings. Number 10. Ricky Nelson Rick, or Ricky Nelson as he was known, launched his musical career as a teenager on the Ozzy and Harriet TV show. He scored a string of pop, rock, and country hit songs in the 1960s, then his career stalled in the 1970s. However, in 1985, Nelson was on a comeback tour, but Ricky Nelson had a paralyzing fear of flying. But he was also uncomfortable about bus travel. But in May of 1985, he decided he needed a private plane for touring. So he paid $118,000 for a 14-seat 1944 Douglas DC-3. This plane once had belonged to the DuPont family and later to Jerry Lee Lewis. But soon after Nelson bought the plane, it was plagued with a history of reoccurring mechanical problems. On December 26, 1985, Nelson was leaving for a gig in Guntersville, Alabama. They took off from Guntersville for a New Year's Eve celebration in Dallas. At approximately 5.14 p.m. Central Standard Time on December 31st, the plane crash-landed outside of DeKalb, Texas, northeast of Dallas, in a cow pasture less than two miles from a landing strip, colliding with trees on its way down. Seven of the nine occupants on the plane were killed in the crash and resulting fire, including Nelson, his fiancé, and band members. Reports vary as to whether or not the plane was on fire before it crashed, though some witnesses attested that it was indeed engulfed in flames while still airborne. However, NTSB Chairman Jim Burnett said that although the plane was filled with smoke, it landed and came to a stop before it was completely swallowed by flames. When questioned by the NTSB, pilots Brad Rank and Ken Ferguson had different accounts of key events. They basically blamed each other. Ken Ferguson said they had a fire in the plane's heater and Rank left the cockpit to handle that. According to Rank, the heater was fine and cool to the touch. Hey, uh, one one Yankee, can you make it back to Texarkana? We got a we got to get off the ground. We got a smoke in the cockpit. Yankee, you're breaking up. Uh, can you state your nature of the emergency? Said he had smoke in the cockpit center, 1756 relay. Well, there's smoke in the cockpit. After the plane crashed, Ferguson and Rain climbed out through the cockpit window, suffering extensive burns. They shouted to the passenger cabin, but there was no response. So Ferguson and Rank backed away from the plane, fearing an explosion. But Ferguson stated that Rank told him in a panic, Don't tell anyone about the heater. Don't tell anyone about the heater. Even though he never mentioned the problematic heater, Rank stated that he went to the rear of the plane to check the heater. He saw no smoke and found that the heater was cool to the touch. He said that after activating an automatic fire extinguisher and opening the cabin's fresh air inlets, he returned to the cockpit where Ferguson was already asking air traffic controllers for directions to the nearest airfield. In their findings, Rank was criticized by the NTSB for not following the in-flight fire checklist, opening the fresh air vents instead of leaving them closed, 
not instructing the passengers to use supplemental oxygen, and not attempting to fight the fire with the handheld fire extinguisher that was in the cockpit. The board said that while these steps might not have prevented the crash, they would have enhanced the potential for survival of the passengers. And the NTSB was right, because apparently the passengers weren't killed on impact. Lewis Glover, one of the first firefighters on the scene, said all the bodies were at the front of the plane. Apparently, they were trying to escape the fire, he said. Number 9, 8, and 7. Buddy Holly, age 22, Richie Balance, age 17, and the Big Bopper, age 28. On February 3, 1959, American rock and roll musicians, Buddy Holly, who crooned That'll Be the Day in Peggy Sue, 17-year-old Richie Valance, who had a monster hit with La Bamba at the time, and the big bopper, J.P. Richardson of Chantilly Lace and Little Red Riding Hood fame, were all killed in a plane crash near Clear Lake, Iowa, together with pilot Roger Peterson. The event will become to be known as the day the music died, after singer-songwriter Don McLean referred to it as such in his 1971 song, American Pie. But at the time, Holly and his band, consisting of Waylon Jennings, Tommy Alsop, and Carl Bunch, were playing on the Winter Dance Party tour across the Midwest. Rising artists Valens, Richardson, and vocal group Dion and the Belmonts had joined the tour as well. After stopping at Clear Lake to perform, and frustrated by the conditions on the tour buses, Holly chose to charter a plane to reach their next venue in Moorhead, Minnesota. The Big Bopper, Richardson, suffering from the flu, swapped places with Jennings, taking his seat on the plane, while Alsop lost his seat to Valens on a coin toss. Well, you could say Alsop actually won that coin toss. However, soon after takeoff late at night and in poor, wintry weather conditions, the pilot lost control of the light aircraft, the Beechcraft Bonanza, which crashed into a cornfield, killing all four on board. At the time, the weather at Mason City Municipal Airport was snowy, windy, and cold with low visibility. Although deteriorating weather was reported along the planned route, the weather briefings the pilot, Peterson, received failed to relay that information. The plane took off normally from runway 17, which is runway 18 today, at 12.55 a.m. Central Standard Time on Tuesday, February 3rd. Hubert Jerry Dwyer, owner of the flying service, watched the southbound takeoff from a platform outside the control tower. He was able to clearly see the aircraft's taillights for most of the brief flight. But around 1 a.m. when the tower failed to make repeated radio contact with the plane without success, later that morning airfield owner Dwyer retraced Peterson's planned route by air and around 9.35 a.m. spotted the wreckage less than six miles northwest of the airport. Peterson, the pilot, had over four years of flying experience and had accumulated 711 flying hours, of which 128 were on the Bonanza. He had also logged 52 hours of instrument flight training, and although he had only passed his written examination, he was never instrument rated. Peterson and Dwyer Flying Service itself was certified to operate only under visual flight rules. On the night of the accident, visual flight rules would have been virtually impossible due to darkness and weather conditions. Furthermore, Peterson, who had failed an instrument check ride just nine months before, had received his instrument training on airplanes equipped with a conventional artificial horizon as a source of aircraft attitude information. While the plane he was flying was equipped with an older type Sperry F3 attitude gyroscope, Crucially, though, the two types of instruments display the same aircraft pitch attitude information in graphically opposite ways. Meaning on the old style, the ground was on the top where the sky should be. What genius thought of that, I don't know. The NTSB concluded that the probable cause of the accident was the quote pilot's unwise decision to attempt a flight that required skills he did not have. Number 6. Otis Redding. Age... 26. Oh yeah, Otis Redding, sitting on the dock of the bay. Try a little tenderness. These arms of mine, or how about hard to handle? Yeah, the Black Crows took that one from Otis. Or those other classics, I've been loving you too long, Mr. Pitiful, my girl, or fa fa fa. And that is literally just scratching the surface of his hits. Holy crap, Otis Redding was an absolute treasure lost. 
By 1967, Otis and the band was traveling to performances in Redding's Beechcraft H-18 airplane. On Sunday, December 10, they were set to play at the factory nightclub near the University of Wisconsin. Although the weather was poor with heavy rain and fog, and despite warnings, the plane took off. Four miles from their destination at Truax Field in Madison, pilot Richard Frazier radioed for permission to land. Shortly thereafter, without warning, the plane crashed into Lake Monona. Barkay's member Ben Cauley, the accident's only survivor, said he was sleeping shortly before the accident. He woke just before impact to see bandmate Fallon Jones look out a window and exclaim, Oh no! Cauley said the last thing he remembered before the crash was unbuckling his seatbelt. He then found himself in frigid water, grasping a seat cushion to keep afloat because he couldn't swim. The cause of the crash was never determined. Besides Redding, the other victims of the crash were four members of the Bar Kays, guitarist Jimmy King, tenor saxophonist Fallon Jones, organist Ronnie Caldwell, and drummer Carl Cunningham, their valet Matthew Kelly, and the pilot Frazier. Redding's body was recovered the next day in the lake. Redding died just three days after recording Sitting on the Dock of the Bay. Sitting on the Dock of the Bay was released in January 1968. It became Redding's only single to reach number one on the Billboard Hot 100 and the first posthumous number one single on U.S. chart history. Number five, Jim Croce, age 30. Ah, Jim Croce. As a kid, I knew all of his songs by heart. Time in a Bottle or Bad, Bad Leroy Brown. I like that song because I got to say the word damn for the first time. How about You Don't Mess Around With Jim, among many others that are still classics. On the night of Thursday, September 20, 1973, during Crochet's Life and Times tour, which had been scheduled for 45 dates, and the very day before his ABC single I Got a Name was released, such a great song. Croce and five others were killed when their chartered Beechcraft E-18S crashed into a tree during takeoff from Natchitoches Regional Airport in Natchitoches, Louisiana. Croce was 30 years old. Others killed in the crash were pilot Robert N. Elliott, Croce's bandmate Maureen Malhusen, comedian George Stevens, manager and booking agent Kenneth DeCortese, and road manager Dennis Rast. An hour before the crash, Croce had completed a concert at Northwestern State University's Prather Coliseum. He was flying to Sherman, Texas for a concert at Austin College. An investigation by the NTSB named the probable cause as the pilot's failure to see the tree due to physical impairment and because fog reduced his vision. The 57-year-old Elliot suffered from severe coronary artery disease and had run three miles to the airport from a motel. He had an ATP certificate, 14,290 hours of total flight time, and 2,190 hours in the Beach 18-type airplane. But the investigation placed sole blame on pilot error because of his downwind takeoff into a, quote, black hole of severe darkness, limiting his use of visual references. Number 4. Patsy Cline age 30. With such hits as Stand By Your Man, Crazy, Walking After Midnight, and so many more, by the age of 30, Patsy Cline was already a bona fide music legend. Around 2 p.m. on Tuesday, March 5, 1963, a Piper Comanche piloted by Randy Hughes departed Dyersburg Regional Airport in Dyersburg, Tennessee. During pre-flight at 5.05 p.m., he requested a weather briefing for the remainder of the flight to Nashville. He was informed by FAA employee Leroy Neal that local conditions were marginal for VFR flight and weather at the destination airport was below VFR minimums. Hughes then informed Neal he would fly east towards the Tennessee River and navigate to Nashville from there, as he was familiar with the terrain in that area, and stated that he would attempt a flight and return if weather conditions worsened. Shortly after takeoff at 6.07 p.m., no further radio contact was made with the plane. A short time later, a witness about four miles west of Camden heard a low-flying aircraft on a northerly course. The engine noise increased and seconds later a white light appeared from the overcast descending at a 45 degree angle. At 6.29 p.m. the aircraft crashed into a wooded swampy area one mile west of Camden. 
The aircraft was destroyed on impact and all four occupants were killed. At 6.10 a.m. on March 6, the wreckage was discovered. A three-foot hole indicated the area of initial impact, and debris was scattered over an area of 166 feet long and 130 feet wide. During the FAA investigation, the aircraft's propeller was found to have contacted a tree 30 feet above the ground, while the aircraft was in a 26-degree nose-down attitude. The right wing then collided with another tree 32 feet to the right, causing the airplane to become inverted. The downward angle increased to 45 degrees and the Comanche hit the ground at an estimated speed of 170 miles per hour, about 62 feet from the initial contact. Inspection of the airframe and engine disclosed that the aircraft was intact and the engine was developing substantial power before impacting the trees. Investigators found no evidence of engine or system failures or malfunction of the aircraft prior to the crash. An autopsy of the pilot discovered no physical or medical concerns that could have been a factor in the accident. Investigators believed that Hughes entered an area of deteriorating weather with low visibility and lost his visual reference with the ground. This induced a spatial disorientation and eventually led to a graveyard spiral with the aircraft entering into a right-hand diving turn with a nose-down attitude of 25 degrees. When the aircraft cleared the clouds, Hughes attempted to arrest a high descent rate by pulling the nose up and applying full power, but it was too late. The FAA's final conclusion was that the non-instrument rated pilot attempted visual flight in adverse weather conditions, resulting in disorientation and subsequent loss of control. <laughs> Number 3. Randy Rhodes, age 30. Besides shredding his trademark polka dot flying V guitar with Quiet Riot and the Ozzy Osbourne band, Randy was a classically trained guitar player and music teacher. At the time of his death, he said he was tired of life on the road watching Ozzy Osbourne destroy himself with drugs and booze, and Randy was leaving the band to go back to school. Rhodes played his last show on Thursday, March 18, 1982 at the Knoxville Civic Coliseum. The next day, the band was heading by bus to a festival in Orlando, Florida. Ozzy Osbourne recalls his final conversation with Rhodes that night on a bus involved all five foot seven, 100 pounds of him admonishing Ozzy over his heavy drinking. The last thing Rhodes said to him that night was, You're going to kill yourself, you know, one of these days. After driving much of the night to Orlando, the bus stopped at the Flying Baron Estates in Leesburg, Florida to fix a broken AC unit while Osborne remained asleep. On the property, owned by the Calhoun Tour Bus Company, there was a private airstrip with helicopters and small planes all owned by the Calhoun brothers. In the morning, and without permission, Ozzy's tour bus driver and private pilot Andrew Acock took a single-engine Beechcraft F-35 plane and started giving rides to willing band members, which once airborne, he kept dangerously buzzing the tour bus with the Beechcraft. The group then landed, and a second flight soon took to the air, this time with Rhodes, who had a fear of flying, but thought it would be a good opportunity to take pictures for his mom to see. Also on board was makeup artist Rachel Youngblood. Randy had tried unsuccessfully to coax bassist Rudy Sarzo to join him on the flight, but Sarzo chose to get some sleep instead. During the second flight, more attempts were made to buzz the tour bus. Acock succeeded in making two close passes, but botched the third attempt. At about 10 a.m. after being in the air for approximately five minutes, one of the plane's wings clipped the top of the tour bus, breaking the wing in two parts and sending the plane spiraling out of control. The initial impact with the bus caused Rhodes and Youngblood's heads to crash through the plane's windshield. The plane then severed the top of a pine tree and crashed into the garage of a nearby mansion bursting into flames. Rhodes was killed instantly, as were Acock and Youngblood. All three bodies were burned beyond recognition and Rhodes was identified by dental records and personal jewelry. Some witnesses on the ground said just before it hit the bus, they could see it look like Randy was trying to wrestle control of the plane away from the pilot, trying to divert the aircraft. 
According to Sharon Osborne, who was asleep in the bus and awakened by the crash, she said they were all in bits. It was just body parts everywhere. Oh, did I forget to mention the pilot was high on cocaine while performing these stunts? Of course he was. While he had his pilot's license, he had let his medical certificate expire, so he was prohibited from flying. And in a final note, the bus driver, or pilot's ex-wife, worked with Ozzy Osbourne's band and was on the bus at the time. And she thinks it was an attempt to kill her and himself, along with the bus and the band in the process. However, that has never been proven. Number 2. Stevie Ray Vaughan, 35. There's been a major blow to the rock music world. A deadly helicopter crash early this morning in Wisconsin. Five people have been killed, including rock guitarist Stevie Ray Vaughan and other members of rock star Eric Clapton's band. Clapton, however, was not aboard the helicopter. Described by the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame as the second coming of the blues and one of the most influential blues guitarists of the 1980s. Blues legend and guitar god Stevie Ray Vaughan left this earth too soon. The day before his death, Stevie Ray Vaughan allegedly told his band and crew members about a nightmare he had, in which he was at his own funeral and saw thousands of mourners. He said he felt terrified, but almost peaceful. Then just moments later, Clapton's tour manager, Peter Jackson, said that the weather was getting worse and they had to leave soon. Vaughn's last words to drummer Chris Layton were, I love ya. Four helicopters were waiting on a golf course to take the group to Chicago. Vaughn boarded the third helicopter alongside Clapton's agent, Bobby Brooks, bodyguard Nigel Brown, and assistant tour manager, Colin Smythe. The helicopter, a Bell 206B Jet Ranger, was piloted by Jeff Brown. It departed in dense fog at 1 a.m. Central Daylight Time. Brown flew the helicopter off the golf course at a higher speed and slightly lower altitude than the others. Suddenly it banked sharply to the left and crashed into the side of a 300-foot ski slope, about 0.6 miles from takeoff. All on board were killed instantly. No fire or explosion occurred, and the bodies and debris were scattered over 200 feet. No one was even aware of the crash until the helicopter failed to arrive at its destination. A Wisconsin Civil Air Patrol search plane found the wreckage at about 7 a.m. 50 feet below the summit of the hill. Shortly after, Clapton and Jimmy Vaughn, his brother, were called to the morgue to identify the bodies. According to an autopsy report, Vaughn had suffered many gruesome and unsurvivable injuries. However, the investigation found that no drugs or alcohol were involved and that all victims had worn their seatbelts. No mechanical failures or malfunctions were found with the helicopter. The pilot, Brown, had many hours of experience operating the Bell 206B at night, but was only instrument rated on airplanes, not helicopters. In fact, not long before the flight, he had failed an instrument check ride. According to the NTSB, the cause of the accident was deemed controlled flight into terrain, as Brown could not see the hill due to low visibility. Number 1. Leonard Skinner It is shortly before 6 o'clock Central Daylight Time. The pilot, Walter McCreary of Dallas, Texas, radios Houston Air Traffic Control. He's low on fuel and can't make Baton Rouge 80 miles away. Instead, he'll try for a small airport at nearby Macomb, Mississippi. Ten minutes from the Baton Rouge airport that we ran out of gas, and uh, I just heard the pilot go, oh my God. Pilot McCreary turns his plane to the left and starts back toward Macomb. For reasons unknown, McCreary changes his mind and heads for a better spot, a pasture off to his left. The Convair 240 is in a glide, a hundred yards short of the pasture. The wings are clipping treetops. The plane stalls and goes down. On October 20, 1977, a Convair CB240 passenger aircraft ran out of fuel and crashed in a wooded area near Gillsburg, Mississippi. It was flying from Greenville, South Carolina to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, crashing near its destination. Leonard Skinner lead vocalist and founding member Ronnie Van Zandt 
guitarist and vocalist Steve Gaines, backing vocalist Cassie Gaines, Steve's older sister, assistant road manager Dean Kilpatrick, Captain Walter McCreary, and First Officer William John Gray all died as a result of the crash. Twenty others survived, but had serious to grave injuries. Near the end of the flight, just before Baton Rouge, the plane ran out of fuel. Most of the survivors had been seated toward the back of the plane. The survivors, all of whom were seriously injured, were transported to different hospitals for treatment and were not immediately aware of the fatalities. Rossington, for instance, was not informed until days later by his mother in the hospital that Van Zandt had been killed. Cassie Gaines had been so fearful of flying in the Convair that she preferred to travel in the band's cramped equipment truck instead, but Van Zandt convinced her to board the plane on October 20. But in a foreboding twist, it was later discovered that the very same aircraft had earlier been inspected by members of Aerosmith's flight crew for possible use in their Draw the Line tour, but it was rejected because it was felt that neither the plane nor the crew were up to standard. Aerosmith's assistant chief of flight operations, Zunk Bunker, good name, told of observing pilots Mercury and Gray sharing a bottle of Jack Daniels while he and his father inspected the plane. Aerosmith was quite shaken after receiving word of the crash, as Steven Tyler and Joe Perry had pressured their management into renting that specific plane for use on their tour. The doomed flight of October 20, 1977 was also intended to be the last Leonard Skinner would ever make on the conveyor. We were flying in a plane that looked like it belonged to the Clampett family, drummer Artemis Pyle said, and the band decided that their status as one of the world's top rock acts warranted an upgrade. The band had planned on acquiring a Learjet after arriving in Baton Rouge to replace the 30-year-old plane, which all in the band agreed was well past its prime. Indeed it was. Unfortunately, Leonard Skinner had to find out the hard way. And with that, that wraps up our very sad aviation top 10. But I know there have been many more celebrities killed in aviation accidents, and we only hit 10 of them. So tell me down below which rock star or movie star you think about when it comes to aviation crashes. And let's all continue the conversation down below. That's all I have for now. Thanks for watching. This is Maximus.